everyone, my name is Terry, and welcome to my channel, The Pink Dumbbell Problem. This is a new episode in the In the Discourse series. In the Discourse is a new series where I'm going to talk about things that I see in the news or on social media or whatever's causing a buzz out there. And it's not a ranking of news items or anything like that in order of importance or size or anything else. It's just something that I feel I want to talk about because it fits the themes of my channel. I am also going to add a new segment to this video today. First time I'm doing this, this video is going to have a comment response section. So I'm going to talk about the new article first, and then I'll talk about comments that I got on my last in the discourse video. Today in the discourse, I want to look at this Twitter post from author and tweeter extraordinaire, Mona El Tahawe. Justice Amy Coney Barrett said pregnant women who do not want to raise a young child can put the baby up for adoption. If so, she said, the lack of access to abortions should not have a great impact on their lives and careers. Oh, Amy. Oh, dear, dear Amy. Let me be clear on something. Adoption is, as Coney Barrett said, for those who don't want to raise a child. Abortion is for those who don't want to be pregnant. Thinking that abortion is simply a matter of not wanting to raise a child is incredibly naive, but she's not doing that or saying that because she's naive. I don't believe with all her education and experience to be on the Supreme Court of the USA that she's that naive. No. What she's doing here, of course, is trying to sow a false narrative that the people who get abortions are simply ignorant or neglectful of the idea of adoption. What she seems to be ignoring here is the physical toll it takes on a person's body to be pregnant for nine months and then deliver the child. Even if you deliver surgically, it's still a heck of a lot of trauma to the body. And nobody's body is ever the same after they've had a child. Absolutely not. And keep in mind too, this is happening in the United States where there's no universal health care. So a lot of people have to pay for pre and postnatal care and the delivery itself out of pocket. It's thousands of dollars to birth a child in that country. The other reason I wanted to bring this up is it's a great example of how people on the far right love to ignore intersectionality while also sneering down their noses at it. Just a little over a year ago, I did a whole video on intersectionality. So I'll put the link to that below in the info box. So please check that out when you're finished with this one. But basically intersectionality is looking at how marginalizations intersect in individual people's circumstances. It is, as I said in my other video, the crossroads. What you often hear from people speaking from the right-wing perspective is things like, oh, intersectionality is just the oppression Olympics and everybody's trying to be, I'm more oppressed than you and da 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 da. That's not what it's about. It's actually a really useful and very positive tool for making sure that we understand how different societal norms and changes, and in this case, potentially changes to the law, impact people differently because they have different marginalizations all intersecting in their life. So please, as I've said many times before, don't let somebody who hates feminism and intersectionality tell you what intersectional feminism is. So what she's ignoring here is obviously the cost. And she also is kind of making it sound like there's a shortage of children out there to adopt. Now, that can't really be the case because according to several reports that I saw on several different news sites and of course all over Twitter once again, is that there's somewhere in the ballpark of 400,000 kids in the States awaiting adoption right now. Mm, not a shortage. And having that child and setting it up for adoption is certainly not a replacement for the abortion that somebody wants because they personally have medical issues that could be very dangerous in a pregnancy or because they've got uh, conditions, say, like tocophobia, which is the fear of pregnancy, which is very common in the child-free movement. I am a child-free person. Uh, I don't consider it child-free by choice because I don't consider it a choice. I consider it just a fundamental part of who I am and how I identify. But for a lot of people who are child-free, tocophobia is the reason that they don't want to have a pregnancy and have a child. And of course, she's also ignoring the whole thing of gender transition because there are men who are trans men who have not had a hysterectomy and they can and sometimes do still get pregnant. Some of them take the pregnancy to full term. Some of them want abortions too. She's also completely ignoring race. Not only are women of color at higher risk during pregnancy because of shoddy medical care from racial bias, but their children are less likely to be adopted as well. So she's painting this rose colored picture that Adoption is simply the answer and we won't ever have to have abortions anymore because, hey, you can just go adopt if only you had thought of that, you silly, silly girl. This is why intersectional feminism is so important and so valuable and such a wonderful tool for how we analyze things because she's not doing that and look at all of the things that she failed to consider. I've never done comment responses before. I don't get a ton of comments, so uh, I don't know if I'll be doing this every video, but hey, you know, 
let's see what happens. The first thing is the comment directly on the video here on YouTube from my last in the discourse. And Antonio asked if I had made the turquoise sweater that I was wearing and I didn't. But for those of you who have been watching the channel for a while or follow me on Twitter, you know I'm a big knitter and uh, in this case crochet. So I didn't make the sweater for that. Um, that was a, uh, actually a buy at a thrift store that I just happened upon that I really liked. So I figured I better wear something I made today and I just finished this scarf a couple of days ago. I don't know how well you, there you go. You can see it a little better there. Now the other series of comments on this video weren't actually on the video and they only just happened this week. So my last ITT video was on the hidden case of Ewan Forbes and I knew going into it that this was going to cause the gender critical or um, transphobic wing of the internet to come after me. Every time I mention trans issues in any way, shape, or form in a video, they do come up a call in pretty fast. In other words, my trans rights discourse brings all the turfs to the yard. There's a person out there on Twitter. They claim to be a lawyer and they're claiming that everything in Zoe Playden's book is legally misinterpreted and that Playden got the wrong end of the stick and therefore all of those that are supporting the book are therefore duped. One of their friends who also claims to be a lawyer, which of course we can't verify because these people are all using pseudonyms on Twitter. This, this friend, presumably, came directly to my tweet of the video and we had a little back and forth over several hours on uh, Tuesday. I even gave this person several chances to say, oh, I'm not transphobic, I'm just concerned about the law, including saying, I get that you're just concerned about the exact wording of the law. She never went for it. And her Twitter timeline is full, full of anti-trans garbage, including tweets from all of the biggest public figures in the anti-trans side of things in the UK. I mean, it's pretty darn clear where she's coming from. These posts are up on my Twitter account, you can go see them, but I'm actually not going to show you the name or the handle of the person here, because if this person ever decides that she wants to come around on this and denounce her anti-transness, then I don't want this video, which I won't be able to edit once it goes up, I don't want this video to be a lasting legacy of that. I want to give her the chance sometime in the future, hopefully near future, to have a turnaround on this and this not be something that haunts her in the future. Now, here's the thing. I actually don't give a damn one way or the other if Platon's interpretation of the law is correct. That's not what my video was about. It was about the agnotology. This particular comment is what I really need to unpack a little bit and clarify. Here we go. They are experts in the field. You are deliberately choosing to prefer the book's narrative over a legal fact, in which case you are yourself a vector of the agnotology you purport to attack. I will be extremely charitable and suggest that perhaps she made a slip, a Freudian slip, but a slip, and said agnotology when she meant to say ignorance. In other words, the ignorance I purport to attack. I'm probably preaching to the choir here because if you're on this channel, you've probably already watched at least a couple of my videos on agnotology, and so you know where I'm going with this. But agnotology is not ignorance itself. It's the study of and the philosophy of ignorance. It's trying to come to understand how we as not just individuals, but as a society have been kept ignorant of certain things. In this particular case, and in many cases where I talk about strategic ploy agnotology, it's specifically about how information is hidden so that we don't even know it exists. At no point, and I read all these threads, including an extremely long one from her friend uh, who also claims to be a lawyer in the UK, nowhere in that did they deny that anything in the case about Ewan Forbes was hidden or that there was what, again, I said, is effectively by today's standards a non-disclosure agreement. That was the whole point. That's where the agnotology comes in. What she's actually arguing is probably a matter of legal opinion and interpretation. And that's fine. The lawyers can go ahead and duke that out. I don't really care. The other thing that's important to note in this tweet reply, in this sentence specifically, is that she says, I purport to attack agnotology. So first of all, I don't attack agnotology and I don't attack ignorance either. Several months ago, I did another video on, it was my Agnotology part three of the Friday Fact Day series. And I talked about what ignorance really means in the context of agnotology. And again, I'll put the link down below for that video. It's actually one of my most popular videos, which I suspect is because it may be touching a nerve to use the word ignorance. Now this person ran off having seen the word ignorance and just rolled with it. Didn't actually stop to understand what that means in the context of agnotology. As always, thank you so, so much for watching. Please share your comments and questions down below. I love to read them and click the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't already. And there's again, those two links down below. Go check those out if you haven't yet. It means everything to me if you can share these videos and encourage other friends to come over here to YouTube and click that red button and the notification bell, ding, 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 
right next to it so that you know when my Friday videos go up. And of course, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Lift heavy, fight the patriarchy, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye.